Yes. Welcome back <laughs> after the coffee break. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Tefera Belachev. He's a medical doctor by profession, as you can see here um, on the title slide as well. He holds a master's degree in public health and a master's degree and a PhD in human nutrition and is a professor at the human nutrition unit of the College of Public Health and Medical Sciences. And he is the dean of the School of Graduate Studies at Jimma University. And we now look very much forward to his presentation on improving food and nutrition security through multi-sector approaches. So welcome to the stage and thank you very much for joining us here. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, John. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Hwanen University and Awasa University for giving me this opportunity. I'm very pleased to be here and share my uh, experience. So my experience, uh, my presentation uh, emanates from my involvement in the design of uh, national nutrition strategy back in 2005 and uh, in the development of national food and nutrition strategy, which is a multi-sectoral issue. And, uh, I have been involved in teaching for the last 20, 23 years in my University. Uh, so I will be uh, just touching uh, upon uh, some of the background issues on uh, food and nutrition security and uh, finalize my presentation with, uh, you know, the National Nutrition Program, how it went and, <coughs> and the way forward will be the National Food and Nutrition uh, policy. So these are issues considered in designing food and nutrition policies. So these are the topics uh, I will be covering. I will have introduction, brief status of food and nutrition uh, security in Ethiopia, its drivers and the nutrition problems in the past, present and the future, <coughs> and the experience and the challenges of multi-sectoral nutrition coordination uh, and the way forward. So. First of all, we have to agree on the, the, uh, on the definitions of food security and nutrition security. So there are some, you know, confusions and uh, interchange, uh, you know, user usage of these terms interchangeably, but they are uh, quite different issues. Nutrition security is a broad term that encompasses uh, three pronged underlying causes. Uh, food, is, food security, it's the, uh, the major pillar for nutrition security. Food security, health, and the care for the vulnerable segments of the population. The caring aspect includes uh, caring for children, women, pregnant and lactating women, disabled people, uh, elderly, and so on. So, Ethiopia has signed the global conceptual framework for addressing malnutrition. It's a signature country. So, as it was said, you know, the best good in signing conventions, international agreements, accords. So, uh, it has. This is the way nutrition is being addressed in Ethiopia now. The, the both national food, food and nutrition strategy, uh, national nutrition strategy, national food, uh, uh, national nutrition program, and the the new policy, the newly endorsed policy, has this uh, has taken this into consideration. So, the food care health framework is taken initially. Uh, food security used to be addressed as a food biased approach, you know, considering that food security per se will address nutrition security. So now these are considered. If you look at uh, this picture, can uh, this graph can uh, capture the issue very well. So food security, uh, you know, these are the production, purchase, donation, all, you know, sources, uh, this contribute to food security the food intake, but the caring, health, and environmental issues are very critical for nutrition security, which is nutritional status. So these are determinants for uh, having nutritional status. Having adequate food per se is not sufficient. So uh, there should be caring and there should be environmental issues. I'll just discuss uh, as we go along. You know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the problems, the nutritional problems that the country is facing. If you look at this picture, uh, this is, uh, no, there is undernutrition, hungry, you know, there are different sectors, food insecure people. There is nutrition insecurity, you know, this big circle is nutrition insecurity, it also includes overnutrition. Having access to food doesn't guarantee nutrition security because nutrition security is nutritional status. Overnutrition is also another uh, uh, nutritional insecurity or uh, malnutrition. When we come to uh, food security, it's a very contentious subject. There are about 500 indicators, 200 definitions. I did my PhD on nutrition, uh, you know, food security. So uh, the most agreed upon definition by development actors and researchers is 
the one uh, you know declared, uh, developed by the World uh, Food, Summit, Food Summit Declaration 1996, and uh, again you know uh, uh, modified by FAO in 2009. As you see, there is uh, uh, it's all people have all all the times have access, physical, social, economic access to uh, nutritious, safe food, which allows them to have optimal nutrition, and it's according to their preference. All these are political terms, according to their preference. We cannot give meat uh, people food that they don't prefer. Their cultural preferences and their uh, should be uh, respected. When we look at the time dimensions of food security, there are chronic food insecurity, which is related to abject poverty, and acute food insecurity or transient food insecurity, we call it seasonal food insecurity, which uh, happens because of shocks in price uh, of foods or maybe disasters or man-made or natural disasters can drive it. In Ethiopia, both are widespread and severe. As you know, in Ethiopia, there has been a lot of, I mean, several boats of uh, uh, this food insecurity. Just look at current stats of food insecurity. There are reports of food insecurity right from uh, 1953, you know, all the way, you know, several uh, magnitude of people or several, uh, I mean, uh, have been affected by different droughts and so on. And uh, when you look at most of the drivers, these, uh, the drivers have to do with shortage of, seasonal shortage of rain and conflict and, uh, you know, uh, price raises and so on and so on in different parts of the country. But the biggest number of people which went into food insecurity was 27 million in uh, uh, 20, 2015 to 16. This is because of the Elino affecting uh, the two harvest seasons, the Belgian, the, the, the main, main harvest seasons. But the good thing is about 18 million people required assistance, but the government has tried to respond on its own without external assistance. And the mortality out of this food security is almost nil. There is no report showing that there are improvements in this regard. Uh, vulnerable people in urban areas, in rural areas, people who are net buyers of food because of price escalations that has never come down, that translated into our local uh, market after the 2005-2008 global food crisis. Uh, so when, when people are net buyers, urban uh, poor people and uh, rural landless people are vulnerable, both to chronic food insecurity and acute food insecurity. There are also uh, displaced people, uh, refugees, especially nowadays there are more displaced people because of these transitional political issues. Displacement is very common. So these are the drivers, I mean, these are the common uh, uh, kind of uh, people vulnerable to this kind of food insecurities. When we look at typical case during the Elino uh, times, this uh, was 2005, September, July, July to septem September 2005. There were no any uh, emergency cases, crisis. Uh, there are some crisis cases, but the most eastern and uh, you know eastern part of the country is stressed, where our western part from north to south is better off. But in a matter of uh, you know few months, a lot of crisis, especially in pastoralist areas, happened. So this shows that you know the the, the production type of production we have is very much uh, marginal and that doesn't last you know longer so it just can uh, lapse we can easily lapse into uh, crisis if there is any kind of uh, faulty rainfall so you can see you know how this has expanded the pastoralist regions especially somalia region and the borana romia regions you know this is another september june to september 2007 and then October uh, to 2008 to January 2008, it has been resolved. But it uh, it's just concentrated in areas where there are these uh, displacements because of conflicts. Displacements, Somali, Ben Shangul, Gumuz, and so on. It has contributed. So, yeah, this is uh, February to May. This is what's expected again, mostly in the pastoralist areas. So these are the situations. So what are the drivers of uh, food supply? I mean, food insecurity. Mainly we can look at this issue from uh, demand side and 
uh, supply side factors and demand side population growth changes in food consumption habits of people and biofuel production and the supply side inadequate production very significant post harvest loss climate change poverty and land degradation are generally the basics uh, to look at the supply side factor if you look at the bigger picture globally the carrying capacity of the earth earth has a limited I mean, surface, you know, all, you know, the, it has all the limited bounties to provide sustenance to human, human life. And uh, when we talk about carrying capacities, the capacity of the earth to provide living space, food, water, and waste disposal, inclu including nuclear waste, industrial waste, and so on. So, if population increases limitlessly, can the earth continue to sub supply these sustenances, or this, uh, can it carry? Population. There are two population theories. The Malthusian theory, we call them the Apocalypseans or the pessimists, and the Easter's, uh, Easter Boserab, is these are the uh, Cornucopians or the, the Pletorics. So they think uh, Malthus, Thomas Malthus in his essay said that if population continues to grow at geometric uh, progression rate and the food grows at an arithmetic progression rate, there will be a time when population growth will surpass food resources, and then there will be a collapse. So there should be preventive checks on population growth, like uh, family planning and others. And uh, if not, if, if no preventive uh, checks are instituted timely, there will be positive checks, like you know, uh, famine and war, conflict, you know, over resources. You know, we are we are seeing these signals in the world. The opponents of this theory, Easter Bosereb, supported by Julian Simon, say that population is an input to development. It's a human capital. So people, when they are short of food, can create, create new ways of producing food, like genetic engineering using biotechnology. After all, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, humankind has created several gadgets to even land on the moon, to explore every you know, aspect of the Earth and uh, the, 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 the universe, so still food can be produced. But the key thing is population is continuing to grow. So the world population is going to be uh, 9.2 billion by 2050, this is projection, 9.2 billion. Where is this population growth occurring? It is occurring mostly in Africa and Asia. In Asia, it's leveling off. Now, India's growth rate is very high. In 2015, India will be number one in the world. The Chinese is uh, having lower population growth rate. So, what about Ethiopia? In Ethiopia, population is growing very rapidly. In 2000, in one, uh, in 1200, uh, I mean, in 1900, uh, we were 11 million, and it took 60 years to double, then 30 years to double, then now 28 years. After 28 years, Ethiopian population will double. If you look at particularly doubling timing, 70 divided by population uh, growth rate, so after 28 years, we will be 250,000 uh, million, million people, so double population. What can we do about population? Can we reduce them? It's very difficult to do that. But we can slow growth rate. Some countries have 100 years for doubling, like a century. After a century, they double, 50 years. So we have to slow down population growth, reduce fertility, uh, uh, total fertility rate, so that population growth or doubling time becomes very, very wide. That's one thing. By 2015, globally, globally, production should be increased by 70% to feed this increase in population. Is it feasible? I will leave that to science and uh, you know, debates. So is it feasible to increase productivity? That's what Thomas Malthus was saying. Soil fertility is limi limited, human fertility is limitless. It can continue. So biofuel production is another demand side. Biofuel is competing with human consumption. I mean, cars are competing with humans. Is it really, does it lead to energy security is another issue. So by 2050, Energy requirement of the world increases by 
And as you know, some nitrogen uh, fertilizers are very, very energy intensive. And uh, this has five times doubled, I mean, uh, the fertilizer uh, cost us by 20, uh, in 20, uh, 2005 to 2008 food crisis, global food crisis. So when we look at the contribution, some evidences show that, you know, biofuel taking 32% of the global energy, uh, the global land, contributes only 2% of energy. So it's competing for arable land. Competing for arable land. And the other very important uh, issue on biofuel is the first generation biofuel is edible crops. It's unethical. Edible crops like starch, corn, soybean, wheat, all these are edible crops. So what some, some critics say, a, a biofuel used for fueling, uh, making a car, one car fuel tank will feed a child for 90 days. So the second generation is lignocellulose cellulosic plants. This is good. These are, you know, non-edible crops. And the third generation is algae. In fact, it's said that it's 30% more efficient than edible crops like soybean. So conversion of algae are not flowering plants. They can grow very fast and, uh, and the marginal land and so on. And the fourth generation is using some uh, engineered crops, you know, uh, engineered green crops as carbon capturing machines and changing, you know, this uh, carbon dioxide into, uh, into, into fuels. So these fourth and third generations are uh, good alternatives. But the question is, in Ethiopia, we use uh, jatropha, palm tree, sugar cane, and, and uh, there is this castor oil also. There are several companies, foreign companies, working on biofuel in different areas. And also there are uh, national companies as well, working on biofuel. And the areas potentially studied to be suitable for, for instance, jatropha production, are, you can see, you know, these are in hectares, you know, 23 million hectares in different regions of the country are uh, said to be very uh, suitable for production of jatropha. The argument is jatropha can, can be used in marginal land, it keeps soil erosion, protective soil erosion, and it's uh, an alternative energy source for import substitution because the country spends 80% of this uh, foreign earning on uh, fuel purchase, and also it creates uh, work locally. But this marginal land is a very elusive subject, and it's decided based on uh, remote sensing without local verification. And there have been several incidents in Harar, for instance, where Hippo, Hippopotamus Sanctuary was given for a company, in fact, for, in fact from Germany, and finally, it, was, it has to be replaced. For, for, for Indians, the Jatropha land was given, and it has to cross uh, you know, farmers grazing or pastoralist grazing lands. So there are several, you know, this marginal land issue should be critically seen. And the farmers' voices, there are farmers' vo voices, uprooting you know, smallholder farmers from their holdings. There was uh, uh, a ground nut crisis, this kind of crisis before you know, uprooting farmers from their holdings is another issue. So it's a direct effect on uh, uprooting farmers from holdings is another contribution to, you know, downside of, uh, the downside of uh, biofuel uh, in uh, contributing to food insecurity. The other one is changes in, in the diet. Especially uh, countries growing very uh, rapidly are changing their diets to animal source food. So what does that mean in terms of uh, you know, sustainable food supply to the world. So co production, for instance, China, if you look at China with the largest population, is shifting to animal source, animal protein, you see? The expectation is very wide. So what does that, this mean? When we shift uh, our food to uh, protein, there will be wastage of calories, wastage of calories. You can look at this. For instance, uh, different calories can be changed, the efficiency of conversion, for different animals, is for instance, uh, for pork, uh, 9%, 13% for poultry, for beef, it is 3%. So the rest is lost. So moving towards consumption of animal source food, like protein, is, uh, is not a sustainable way of feeding the world because animals give out carbon dioxide and take oxygen, and there will be wastage of uh, energy. So this is one of the drivers of the global food crisis in 2008. 
because the agribusiness groups in the West started producing animal source food, feeding them crops, and then this food has to be shifted a lot of miles. So the food miles increased, releasing carbon into the air. So this is not a sustainable way of producing food. So increase, uh, so animal uh, per capita consumption of animal food will, is expected to increase by 60%. So uh, expansion of aquaculture is also expected. So this will uh, uh, lead to loss of energy, loss of energy and int intensifying competition for land. So land is limited. If you look at uh, carbon releases from different food productions, livestock is number one, small ruminants, and then other crops are smaller. So animal source food, do we need it for adults? Do we need it? Adults do not grow in a real linear way. Only children need animal source food for, you know, adults can need, you know, less frequently, that we don't grow, even for health-wise. If you look at water security, water security is another, another issue. How much water do these uh, this food productions take per kilogram? It's a liter per kilogram. For beef, one kilogram, 15,415. For others, it's, it just decreases. You can see water security is another issue encountering this planet Earth. Supply side factors, one is production, the way of production. When we look at production, if we, can, we can see, you know, historically man has been a hunter and a gatherer, a forager, just without adding value at, at, at production, storage, and consumption levels. So, during hunting and gathering, this is a very traditional way of getting food, accessing food from Earth. Whatever the Earth uh, provides, it can support only, you know, evidence shows that 20 to 30,000 uh, uh, people, million people. So these people definitely have to get alternative ways of getting food, like hunting, gathering, uh, either herding, you know, using nomadic lifestyles, or shifting to agriculture, maybe timing animals. Then agriculture was another important step to enhance the carrying capacity of the earth. So shift to agriculture, then, uh, you know, this human being has resistance to shift to this agriculture and settled way of life. And uh, it was just out of necessity that there has to be a shift. So the first plow was inv invented in Mesop uh, Mesopotamia. It's called Ard, comes from the Greek goddess, the name of Greek goddess, allow, around 2000, four, four to uh, 6,000 uh, years before Christ. So this Ard, we, uh, we have it still in Ethiopia, except that this part is changed into metallic. So this population, uh, the nomadic population have to be uh, replaced. I mean, they were assimilated, uh, displaced. Still, there is a need for change. This way of producing is not sufficient. Then population number increased again. So in the modern affluent society, what was done? What was uh, done uh, as a modification to enhance, enhance food production? So the Green Revolution, it was, uh, you know, mechanization of agriculture, pesticides, herbicides, using uh, varieties, improved varieties, and so on, Green Revolution. So this was uh, funded by Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, and uh, this was used in uh, Mexico, India, Southeast Asians, and uh, many other countries. So is it without flow, Green Revolution? There are several uh, downsides of that also. One is loss of biodiversity, monoculture. Only four crops feed the world with potato, rice, wheat, and maize. So monoculture. Fish, you know, days of fish from agricultural, pesti uh, I mean, uh, chemicals, agrochemicals, soil erosions, loss of, uh, you know, fertility, salination, because of flooding, you know, the irrigation used was flooding, so water table comes up with salt, salination, water logging, desertification. So water waste, runoffs, and so on. Air pollution from mechanized agriculture, animals belching methane, you know, carbon dioxide, breathing out carbon dioxide human health problems, contamination of water with nitrites and other agrochemicals, mercury and so on. So this was the downside again. Then the gene revolution, genetic modification. The gene, uh, so genetically modified food. So this is uh, feeding a genetically mo uh, modified crop to animals or genetically modifying uh, you know, animals producing food in that way. 
Is it also flawed as there are anticipated projected advantages and projected disadvantages? Still, food can grow very fast, as pesticide resistant, less spoilage, better flavor, you know. But there could be creation of super weeds, super insects, you know, this can escape into the environment. If this genetic modification escapes to the relatives or species, there can be, uh, uh, there can be uh, a point of no return. So there are still anticipated uh, advantages and disadvantages. So people have also different views about genetically modified food. That we call them Franken foods. So they consider them like, you know, a different... Uh, but it is what, what can be done. Should we die of hunger or resort to this kind of foods? It's like... Uh, being without energy or having nuclear energy and having Chernobyl accident or, or uh, Fukushima accident. How about production in Ethiopia? It's low input, low output, rain-fed agriculture. That's why you know, there is a very quick lapse into food insecurity when there is. The other one is pastoralist way of life. As you see, pastoralist way of life is a very traditional, very old way of capturing food. And a nutrition sensitivity, so questionable. Do we produce for quantity or quality? Are we counting on how much nutrient dense our production is, or are we targeting some nutrition problem? That's another question. If you look at uh, amount of food produced, Ethiopia imports about 20%, okay, about 20% of net import. Especially wheat is imported, oil is imported. How about amount of water used? Ethiopia used only less than 10%, okay, less than 10% of body water. We have a lot of water bodies, with rivers, lakes, different water bodies, but irrigation is very minimal. If you compare it ourselves to Israel, that uh, we, don't, we, haven't, we can say we haven't used irrigation very much. So just have to go a long way. The second one is reducing post-harvest loss. So post-harvest loss is another area which can help us to, 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 to fill this gap in food supply. So in the world, uh, about one third of the food produced is basically lost, thrown away. And uh, this amounts to 1.3 billion tons of uh, food per year. And it, and it can feed about this amount of people, 870,000 people. In developing countries, usually 60 to, uh, 50 to 60 percent of grain is lost at a storage level because of lack of technology, agricultural uh, post harvest technologies for storage, cooling, and so on. It will be stored qualitatively and quantitatively. Look at this. This is a producer's basket. This is a consumer's basket. So the loss is 50 to 60 percent of farm yield, or 60 to 75 percent of amount of harvested, or 70 to 80 percent of initial quota. So it's a significant loss because of many uh, reasons all the way across the value chain. So the reasons, maybe it's eaten by insects, it will be destroyed in cooking, threshing, and so on. You know, contamination, aflatoxin loss, discolorations, all qualitative and quantitative losses can happen. If you compare developing countries and developed countries, mostly developing countries, this is uh, developed countries, uh, losses food waste at plate level. This is a food waste. But for developing countries at storage and, uh, at, at, at storage and the production stage, handling and the storage stage. So this is lack of technology, post service technology. It was one of the loss is not only quantitative, there are qualitative losses also. Qualitative losses include aflatoxin contamination. Aflatoxins, fumonizins, all this mycotoxin contamination. What does that mean? It means now there is a mounting evidence that aflatoxin contamination leads to stunting, chronic malnutrition, stunting. During the Sakota declaration, I was part of that planning for the Ministry of Health. So aflatoxin contamination in, in Sakota area, northern part is around Takaze Bazin, Tigray and uh, Amara region. They store all their sorghums or this uh, machine in the ground. They keep it for two years, you know, keep it for a year, two years. It's a damp environment, there is aflatoxin. So that aflatoxin is almost proven to be uh, the cause of stunting. What it does is it leads to environmental enteropathy. The gut, uh, uh, the gut uh, mucosa will be, you know, changed to this, and it becomes leaky gut. So vaccines, drugs, nutrients leak, leak out. So children get stunted. 
So normally it, sh it should be like this. The absorption surface should be like this, but it will be a leaky gut. So causes stunting. So nutrition insecurity. Post harvest loss in Ethiopia, this is a figure, recent figure, 24% for cereals, 27% for uh, wheat, F is a little bit lower, 21%. Altogether, you can see one third, one, one, fifth, one fourth to one third is lost. And for fruits and vegetables, 15 to 70 percent is lost. Uh, potato from men's, 70 percent. And uh, in Redowa, 50 percent. You know, banana from Arbaminch, a lot of it is lost. So this is a big area we, where we can improve for feeding population. The other one is uh, climate change. So climate change is another supply side uh, uh, factor. So the world climate is temperature is increasing very, uh, you know, linearly. It's increasing over the years. So what does it mean in terms of, you know, we said by 2050, we need to increase production by 70%, but when climate increase uh, by 20, 30%, 10% reduction in production, it will be expected. And by 2050, 20% reduction in production. After all, for one degree centigrade increase in temperature, 46% yield loss will be expected. So this happens all over the world. And for instance, this is uh, Africa. This is Sub-Saharan Africa, like 5 to 22% loss in productivity on, in yield in wheat. Major crops like wheat is expected. Also in Southeast Asia, even in the US, you can see there are losses expected. So climate is really uh, making a big impact on production and productivity. In Africa, usually, uh, water bodies are either floods or, you know, either we have suffered from floods or droughts. So they are not used properly because of poor infrastructure, irrigation infrastructure, and so on. So, so rely, relying on marginal, I mean, low input, low output, rain-fed agriculture will lead to, you know, uh, occurrence of food insecurity. For instance, for Elino, affected areas are this eastern belt, including Ethiopia, is a hard hit, the worst hit. These areas, you know, few areas of the world where which rely on weather for productivity. So if the current trend, is con this, this being the current price, if climate change continues, uh, this will be the projected prices, and without climate change, this will be uh, the price raised by 2050. From this to this, uh, if climate changes, the pr food price will increase for major crops, so pr rice, wheat, maize, soybeans. These are the expectations. So there should be climate mitigation and climate adaptation uh, activities. So human activity should be mitigated. Human activities that clear the, you know, making climate worse should be mitigated. And there should be an adaptation to the already changed climate. There should be an adaptation. An adaptation includes uh, producing more resistant, you know, drought resistant crops and using alternative energy sources and so on. Of course, we can uh, have interface between climate adaptation and the mitigation also. Some of like using, you know, uh, alternative energy sources like solar, geothermal, and uh, hydroelectric power. Like in Ethiopia, we are using all this, uh, you know, uh, wind energy also. So climate mitigation and adaptation issues, and there are issues that, that, that we can do in common also. So for countries like southern uh, uh, countries, like Ethiopia, we need to have both mitigation and adaptation, while in the northern countries, mitigation only, because climate has not changed already. So climate has already changed. In general, uh, there should be climate smart agriculture. What it means is, Increasing productivity in a sustainable way, so which crops to produce, which food source to produce, enhancing resilience of uh, producers and the supplier, reducing loss along the value chain, qualitative and quantitative losses along the value chain, reducing emissions of greenhouses. So cl climate smart agriculture is sustainable agriculture plus resilience minus emissions. So producing local food system, reducing food miles is another very important issue. So on nutritional problems, few slides on uh, present, uh, past, and the future. As you see, nutritional problems or nutrition insecurity. When there is food insecurity, it leads to nutrition insecurity, so malnutrition. 
So in the past, these were type of nutritional problems we were having, like wasting, iron deficiency, anemia, goiter, stunting, vitamin A deficiency. How about now? These are the problems. These are problems faced everywhere in the world. In Ethiopia, we have all these problems now. We cannot ignore them. Heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, cataract, stroke, diabetes, hypertension, congenital malformations like neural tube defects and metabolic syndrome. This is a study from uh, in Addis Ababa among workers, health workers and bank workers. As you see, a metabolic syndrome is having three or more of this, you know, abdominal obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and having a high uh, uh, lipid uh, abnormalities. If you have three of them, this is metabolic syndrome. It's very high, 19, 20%. Same study we did in Jimma, we have metabolic syndrome about 90, among academic and administrative staff of Jimma University. In 2015, we have 19.5% have metabolic syndrome. If you look at uh, the risk factors, you see high, uh, high HDL is low. You know, you know, you can see most of them have this waist circumference, waist circumference, abdominal obesity, which is a risk for diabetes mellitus and most of these problems. So. If you look at the mortality and the morbidity from chronic, uh, chronic uh, non-communicable diseases, 51% of the cause of death in Addis Ababa from burial site surveillance survey is chronic diseases, chronic diseases, chronic non-communicable diseases in 2012. So this is a problem that we cannot ignore. But the issue is, are our health services responsive? Our health services are not responsive to the you know, renal failure, you know, for kidney transplantation, for open heart surgery, and so on. So this is the background we have for preparation of the national food and nutrition uh, policy. So what are the, uh, the drivers of the currently uh, occurring uh, emerging problems? There is dietary transition, nutrition transition. As you see, there is a paleolithic dietary pattern, hunter-gatherers. Mono settlement and uh, agriculture began. Pattern one is industrialization and receding famine. So there is a pattern of non-communicable diseases. So we are having, we are swapping between these two. We have triple burden, triple burden of diseases. We have communica non-communicable diseases plus deficiency diseases. But the Western world have behavioral change now. They have handled it. So this second second driver is lifestyle changes. Uh, there is like increased calorie consumption, fat consumption, motorized way of life, and there is uh, economic and social environmental changes, sanitation, and uh, nutrition is improving. There is decrease in life expectancy, uh, decrease in uh, infant mortality, and uh, leading, leading to uh, increased life expectancy. It's 64 years now in Ethiopia, life expectancy is 64 years. This sedentary lifestyle plus aging leads to increased non-communicable diseases and decrease in infectious diseases. So this is a projection in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, chronic non-communicable diseases will supersede infectious diseases by 2030. By the way, so I heard it over the media, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is number one in diabetes mellitus. Number one country in diabetes mellitus, Sub-Saharan Africa. The third uh, driver for that is our history early malnutrition in utero, early malnutrition, fatal origins of adult degenerative disease. If you look at uh, uh, early malnutrition in utero leads to organ stunting, kidney stunting, decrease number of nephron, leads to hypertension, pancreas, isolates of Langerhans, decrease leads to uh, decrease uh, diabetes, diabetes mellitus, muscle mass decreases, basal metabolic rate, and exercise tolerance decreases. Heart cardiomyocytes is a risk for heart, uh, heart failure is high. And the changes in the liver cell number, stunted liver cell, lipid metabolism is affected, so lipid abnormalities. So this is the, the way organs grow. Organs grow, in a, for instance, kidney grows in a concentric way. For instance, when there is a stunting, we grow by hyperplasia, increase in cell number. So organs ca can stop here or here, or they may grow fully. So organ stunting is a reversible historical uh, trauma, nutritional trauma that can lead to fueling of chronic degenerative disease. For instance, uh, 
uh, one kilogram difference in birth weight leads to 230,000 nephron differences. So this person uh, is very close to chronic, linear, chronic kidney disease. You can look at an example of Ethiopian immigrants to Israel. They were born in North Gondar, where there is malnutrition. Maybe they have survived um, some malnutrition in utero during early infancy and so on. These people were airlifted to Israel. In Israel, they have epidemics of all this, you know, high prevalence of diabetes, hypertension also. We can learn from that. When the country is going to middle-income country, when Ethiopia is going to be middle-income country, we are aspiring to be a middle-income country. So if we are in that status, there will be high upsurge of this chronic non-communicable diseases, to which even the health system is not responsive. The fourth one is intergenerational cycle of malnutrition. So, you know, children born with lower weight grow to be child's growth failure, and then adolescents with low height and weight, then the adolescent gets early marriage, it's a gender issue, early marriage, and then she's growing, the child is growing, so it's a survival of the fittest. The, the mother will win. Definitely she will give birth to lower weight babies, short circuit in this, if she grows, she's a small adult woman with epigenetic, epigenetic imprinting. So the, the woman gives birth to lower weight baby. So epigenetics. So epigenetics is uh, the link. It's not genetic. Some people say it's genetically transmitted. Nutrition, malnutrition is genetically transmitted. No, it's not the DNA that's affected, but it's the epigenome or the histone modification, acetylation or deacetylation leads to imprinting of this genetic, uh, this uh, problem. So it's not like mutation permanent change, it's ep epigenetics is the way our genes interact with the environment and they get adapted to harsh conditions. It's a survival factor. So it's the way the gene interacts with the environment by modifying uh, you know, the epigenome. For instance, we can see like epigenome is like software, it's reversible, but genetic DNA changes it's like hardware, it's not reversible once it's changed. So it is the interaction between our genetic makeup uh, with the environment that determines our phenotype, the way we appear. So this is histone, you know, our, around which DNA is wrapped. So the epigenetic factor is curved on the histone tail, on the histone tail. And uh, there are, you know, factors like you know, nutrients like, uh, you know, folic acid, you know, B12, they can uh, donate metals and then there could be repair of this, but there is a uh, capping of this and a transmission, intergenerational transmission of effects. For instance, if you look at this, uh, maternal birth weight and offspring birth, birth weight. This is maternal birth weight, this is offspring birth weight. Low birth weight mothers have low birth weight babies. So there's a linear relationship showing intergenerational link, intergenerational link because of this effects, epigenetic effects. Okay, the last part is experiences from, uh, experiences uh, and challenges of multisectoral food and nutrition security in Ethiopia. So this part, uh, so far, the one I discussed so far is a background to this occurrence. As you know, nutrition, uh, there are several food and nutrition security uh, programs, interventions and, and uh, strategies in Ethiopia. For instance, the growth and transform transformation plan of the country, uh, and the health sector development plan, and uh, you know under which there are uh, health extension program, national nutrition strategy, the food and uh, national nutrition program, the food security strategy, and agricultural development growth program, school health strategy, water and sanitation. These are different sectors. You see, social protection policy. These are different sectors. I just mentioned a few of them, just as, a, as an example. So these programs have been running, but the issue is they are fragmented. They run on their own sectors. There is no systems thinking. You know, in systems thinking, we say the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So if you take a car, for instance, there is a steering wheel, there is a, a, a tire, there, is, there are you know, different parts, engine and so on. If you put them separate, they cannot do what the car can do altogether because there is a system. So. No systems thinking. Why multisectoral approach? The first place, nutritional problems are multisectoral in nature, need multisectoral solution, so multisectoral response. That's one. The other thing is scaling up of 10 
proven nutrition-specific interventions, where nutrition-specific interventions are the ones to be carried out by the health sector, like vitamin A supplementation, deworming, iodine, uh, you know, growth monitoring, and all this. Ten of them are scaled up, and with 90% coverage, this publication in The Lancet showed that they addressed only 20% of the problem. Where is the rest 80? In other sectors. So nutrition used to be considered as, uh, as the work of the health sector. And, and uh, so the National Nutrition Program was prepared from a multi-sectoral perspective. And the different sectors committed. 13 sectors signed on the document. And the 13 sectors were given specific activities on the, on the nutrition strategy. So the governance in the National Nutrition Strategy was by nutrition, National Nutrition Coordination Body, which has all vice ministers of the 13 sectors, the partners, academia. I was part of that, <laughs> representing. I was part of uh, this coordination body representing academia. And there are committees also. It is chaired by the Ministry of Health, co-chaired by Agriculture, and secretary is the Ministry of Education. So it meets biannually and evaluates the different activities in the sectors. Uh, a similar structure was expected at regional level, Wurada level, and down to Kavali level. That was the arrangement when the National Nutrition Strategy was you know, devised as a multi-sectoral program. What are the achievements? Generally, there was child mortal, decrease in child mortality, infant mortality, acute malnutrition decreased, Cl uh, chronic malnutrition also decreased, micronutrient coverage increased, and the mortality due to food insecurity decreased, as we have seen, there is no mortality, and the life expectancy increased to 64 years. Of course, we cannot attribute this to all this program, but, you know, together, given all that programs. This is, for instance, from DHS, you can see uh, infant mortality decreased, child mortality from 2000 to 2016, you can see there are these decreases. There are. But what are the challenges? The challenge was uh, the national nutrition program was not cascaded, to, cascaded down to the regions and what as it was promised. It did not work. It did not. In the regions, regions are implementers. The work is down, down in the Waradas or in the Kabales. But it was just, you know, just a theoretical level. Uh, it was not owned by nutrition sensitive sectors. For instance, other sectors, agriculture, water, industry, they say, okay, give us budget. It was centrally prepared. Indicators are not uh, owned by the, by the sectors. They don't have indicators. They don't report routinely. They are not evaluated by it. So they say, just, we don't have budget. They don't employ in, uh, professionals, nutrition professionals in their sectors and so on. So towards the end, even uh, the, this uh, National Nutrition Coordination Body prepared uh, a balanced scorecard and started asking you know, different indicators by indicating red, green, and, and yellow for the different sectors. You know, th that was, uh, and, and, and uh, the food aspect was not addressed also, food aspect, it was only nutrition program. Food safety and quality issues, for instance, scandals about aflatoxin, about adulterations, and frauds were common, and there is no food law. Uh, policies and programs and, uh, uh, and, uh, of other sectors were not aligned. There was a policy incoherence. For instance, we say breastfeed for six months, but maternity leave is three months by the Minister of Labor and Social Affairs. So there are several policy incoherences. Coherences. Linkages with relevant sectors is not very strong. They don't talk, sectors do not talk uh, to each other. And they, it was not a systems approach. For instance, we don't consider life cycle approach. We focus only under five uh, children, pregnant women, and so on. Adults are forgotten, but cr chronic diseases are overwhelming us. Adults, elderly. And from farm to fork approach, for instance, not across the value chain. For instance, the uh, aflatoxin issue. Milk in Addis Ababa is contaminated with aflatoxin. So, where should we start? If animals are fed aflatoxin contaminated fodder, it will come through the chain. So, you know, or the, this green paper, I mean, uh, this barbary is contaminated with aflatoxin. It comes all the way. So it's not a systems approach. 
sustainable way of dealing with micronutrient deficiencies like food-based approach is not handled. The food-based approach like fortification, uh, food uh, dietary diversification at production level was not included. These are evaluations published in Food and uh, food Nutrition uh, Bulletin by these authors. So the challenges of multi-sectoral uh, implementation, the major uh, challenges were like budget shortage. They don't budget for it to start with. Sectors do not budget for it. Lack of nutrition professionals, they don't employ professionals. Lack of attention, you know, in some regions vary. This is not a problem in Tigray, but in other regions. Low awareness, coordination problem, and others were reported to be challenges. If you look at uh, also again collaboration, the absence of structure and ownership, who, who is owning the program? Who, whose program is nutrition? So nobody has, I mean, it's a, it's a child of everyone, but child of no one alone. Lack of nutrition professionals, poor community awareness, budget shortage, less priority, low awareness of the sectors. So the gaps, although there are some improvements, although there was a refer to make multi-sectoral approach, still stunting the problem. 38% of our children are stunted nationally. 60% in the Sakota area is a big problem. Stunting has an effect that resonates through generations. Lack of effective and food nutrition governance. The governance. One of the problems of national nutrition program was one sector is allocated as a, uh, as a leader, another sector as secretary, all are, all are in equal status. So there is no boss. So there is no super minister. Lack of effective uh, uh, chronic and recurrent food insecurity. As you see, it is just one season of rainfall leads to food insecurity. Micronutrient deficiency, inadequate production, post harvest loss is big. Sustainable, uh, suboptimal food safety and the quality issues. Uh, non complicable diseases are increased, fueled by urbanization, eating out of home, globalization, motorized way of life, but no preparation from the service side, no education even for the public, no guideline. And the interrelationship between these different diseases. For instance, stunting leads to chronic disease, uh, aflatoxin leads to stunting, stunting leads to chronic disease, and so on. They are interconnected. So the whole, so the way forward is the multi-sectoral multi food and nutrition policy was endorsed on November 23, 2018. And it has these seven pillars, seven pillars, the directions. One is ensure availability, accessibility, utilization of diversified, safe, nutritious food, food security aspect. Ensure safety and quality of foods from farm to fork, systems approach. Improve post-harvest management of agricultural products. Ensure optimum nutrition at all stages of life. Provision of timely and appropriate food and nutrition in emergency response uh, from man-made and natural disasters. Strengthen food and nutrition communication to create nutrition literate society. So it's not, you know, uh, the, the, if the community is made lit nutrition literate, they can take healthy diet. And strengthening, uh, establishing a strong food and nutrition governance. Strong and nutrition, food and nutrition governance. So this is a policy, the seven policy directions. The strategy is underway now. It's being uh, uh, worked upon. So this is a change model. A change model. So potential resources. We have potential resources to change these potential resources to these uh, optimal outcomes, like improved quality of life, productivity, and longevity. We need, as a basic cause, we need to have irrigation infrastructure, environmental conservation, population control, basic education, gender equality, social uh, transformation in terms of uh, you know, food cooking, food uh, access, and so on, good governance, poverty reduction, climate resilient local food system, and, and this will lead to food security. You know, here, post-harvest management, irrigation, diversified uh, nutrition sensitive production, local food system, renewable energy, food safety and quality, improved productivity and so on, value addition, but, and uh, improving traditional household food handling and cooking. Women's access to uh, here caring practice inclu includes women's access to cash, economic uh, uh, you know, affirmative actions for girls in, in schools, maternity leaves, daycare, baby-friendly hospitals, and so on. 
here uh, sanitation, water sanitation and hygiene, and uh, you know healthy lifestyles and so on. So these are the sectors. These are immediate causes like treating children with malnutrition, different you know, for micronutrients and a different and a diversified diet, healthy diet will lead to nutrition security. If for security, nutrition security. So this is the, the change model was applied. So this is the governance. So now the governance is changed. The, there will be National Nutrition Food, uh, National Food and Nutrition Council. This council will be led by the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, there will be a secretariat. In the secretariat can be a commissioner or an agency. It will be a hub for coordinating and liaising with the sectors. And uh, there will be technical committee, multi-sectoral nutrition technical committee nationally. Under this uh, secretariat, it has three branches uh, for fortification, for, uh, for services, and for research and advocacy. And regionally, similar kind of structure will be uh, done. So members for the National F uh, Food and Nutrition Committee will be all ministers, not the vice ministers. Ministers, regional presidents, city administrators, because they are the ones who, which, who allocate funds. So it will go all the way to Kabali levels. Kabali level. So this is the governance. So I finish my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, please, you are welcome. One on each side. <laughs> Sorry. Mark in the back. The rest we will have to do during um, lunch. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tafarra, for your uh, nice presentation, very comprehensive. But uh, I just want to raise an issue. You, s you said uh, you tried to show us uh, inefficiency of animal source food, or uh, in conversion efficiency, or energy efficiency of production of animal source food, conversion of grain into animal source food. Uh, I'm afraid this is the reality that we have in the West, and I'm not sure if that is really applicable to Ethiopia and African condition, because animal production in Ethiopia is mainly dependent on cellulosic materials, crop residues, grass, range pasture, that will not have alternative uses, that will not be directly consumed by humans, but that animals can convert into edible and useful and nutritious product for human consumption. So I think if you put that way, it would be misleading. Um, and the other issue is about the need, whether we need animal source food or not. Yes, we need animal source food in Ethiopia, in Africa, because we have the lowest consumption of animal source food. So, uh, but that does not mean, if you consider per capita consumption of animal source food in Ethiopia, it's one of the lowest in the world. But that does not mean that there are no few individuals or groups that overconsume. So we need to be very clear. We need animal source food for those who re really need it, for children. Because uh, I, I think if you, if you generalize based on the reality in the West, I think that would be really misleading. Uh, I think this is the point I have. Want to comment? Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have a microphone. Okay. No, yeah, right. I can speak. Yeah, I, uh, the way I, uh, I try to say about conversion is there is generally a move towards animal source food. We just considering the macro level, the Earth's planet. If you consider moving to animal source food, whatever animals eat, the conversion is very, very, very low. Like, for instance, producing meat is water intensive, energy intensive, and uh, energy intensive in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the carbons. So 
you know, consumption of that will not sustain us. As an adult, we grow only up to 25 years, linearly. We need only minimal supplements for an adult. If you eat, in fact, if you eat animal source food, we will be having the other side of malnutrition. For instance, uh, chronic degenerative disease, that's what we need for. Pure plants, essential amino acids, nine essential amino acids we need for growth, linear growth. For maintenance, we, can, we just mean, we need minimal uh, protein, we can get it from different plants. Uh, I'm not saying that it should not be produced. Ethiopia has eight, gram per, eight kilogram per year per, per capita is the consumption for, uh, for meat. It's the lowest. But children need this definitely. But move, you know, if, if you see global moves, in China, 40% increase, there was a 40% increase in animal uh, beef product, uh, for instance, animal meat, uh, animal food pro, uh, consumption in uh, 2000. 2008. That was one of the drivers for the global food crisis. We have witnessed this in the past, the global food crisis. What happened in the West has translated to our local uh, market. And then Ethiopia food price is very, very high now. The tape price was 300 bir, now it is like 3,000 bir, 10 times more. So this is what it is. So if you want to have sustainable food supply to the world, move towards this animal source food should be considered. Uh, I'm not saying children should grow, definitely. Children need animal source food. Of course, they have to get the nine essential amino acids. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's, you know, what I... Uh, yeah, 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 the mothers need because there is a child inside. No, I'm not saying totally animal source food, but think of the sustainability, the bigger picture. That's what uh, I'm trying to say. I'm not just trying to say that animal source food should be stopped totally, but it should be targeted. We should prioritize. And uh, the other question is uh, conversion rate. Yeah, conversion rate, definitely, I think. I think both of course, the questions are interconnected, so. Any other question? No, sorry, <laughs> we don't have to. I know there are many questions, but in the interest of time, otherwise, we'll actually run very late. Um, so thank you very much. It's very nice. And I think we will have a lot of time during the lunch break to discuss this issue, because I think it's an important one. Um, because we also have to balance individual and global needs of the planet. I'm pretty sure that this is a very interesting topic. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.